Shelby watches us in Maryland, and Shelby said, I have a computer here that was built for gaming, and it always blue screens whenever I start the game. I, I don't think I've been using it for a total of an hour. I've had it to several repair shops. Nobody can figure it out. Would you take a look at it? I said, sure, mail it to me. And so uh, Shelby did, and uh, it's here behind me. I wanted to start by diagnosing this machine here. Now, I did not build this machine. Uh, again, this was sent by a viewer, and let's just take a look at what we've got here. It appears to be a Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo in an NZXT case with an AMD X470 Gaming K4 motherboard from ASRock, uh, Gigabyte, GeForce, GTX, something. <laughs> I don't know which model that is. We got two sticks of G-Skill RAM there. And this motherboard does have the 8-pin and the 4-pin CPU power connector. That 4-pin CPU power connector is not plugged in, nor should it need to be as long as no overclocking is being done. And uh, looks like we've got... Uh, I can't see the power supply under there. It looks like a CX750M Corsair power supply, which is just fine. I don't know how I'm going to replicate the blue screen, uh, in most cases, the first thing I want to do is replicate the customer's uh, error. However, because this requires firing up a game, I think I want to lean towards uh, RAM testing first before I do much of anything else, as well as just looking for anything obvious. I've got a Samsung solid state drive here and a mechanical, is that a mechanical? Looks like a laptop mechanical drive is installed down here for some reason. I don't know why. The reason you don't want to put a laptop hard drive in a desktop are these laptop mechanical drives are much, much slower than the desktop versions. And so the slowest part of your computer is going to limit the performance of the computer. So where I want to start with the diagnostic, uh, I don't know if there's a, an M.2 in here or not, but I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the Samsung drive and I'm going to disconnect this laptop drive here. I think what I want to do right now is simply run a memory test. In most cases, blue screens are caused by bad drivers, incompatible drivers, corrupted files, or uh, bad memory. Now. There's lots of other reasons for blue screens. Those are just the most common reasons that I've encountered. I've got here my Memtest 86 flash drive, and I'm going to plug that in, turn this machine on, power supply is on, and I know there's a power switch up here somewhere. There it is. And let's go over to camera two. Okay, I'm gonna use your monitor. Hang in there for a minute. We're going to try and get to, what is it, F12, F11. One of those is a boot menu. Ooh, that's not good. So I can already see that the BIOS is not set up correctly because it's trying to boot from, uh, from the network, which shouldn't even be an option. That's used in offices where servers provide the operating system for the computer to boot from. So what I want to do, yeah, I want to get rid of that. I want to turn that off because it's really annoying. Okay, F2. I guess I have to be patient. Come on, get me in the BIOS. There we go. That's what I want. And so what I'm going to do, <clears throat> first of all, um, I want to turn this off. So we have two UEFI disks there, and then it does have the USB as the first boot option. And I want to turn on the defaults for the BIOS. So we're going to load the UEFI defaults and click yes on that. And let me go back to boot, make sure that didn't change. And we'll just take a quick look through here for anything obvious or disturbing. We're going to start the computer up again and see 
it should just boot right into memtest86. So the test is going to start automatically here in just a moment. Again, I'm not touching anything. I'm just letting the test do its own thing. And we'll keep an eye on this as it runs uh, through a series of 13 different tests. It's on test number 2 of 13, and it's on pass 1 of 4 passes. That means it goes through potentially all 13 tests four times. And the reason it does that is some memory problems only occur after the memory heats up. In my experience, that's very, very rare. If we can get through one full pass, if you look at the bottom of the screen, it says pass one slash four. The minute that says pass two, then if there's zero errors, because you see right after that, it says errors zero, right at the bottom. Uh, as long as we stay at zero errors on pass two, then I'm not going to run through all, I'm not repeating the test four times, okay? The test takes a while to run. And depending on how much RAM you've got, how fast your computer is, how fast, uh, well, basically, it, 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 how long it takes is based on what you've got and how fast it is. So I could let this potentially run for hours. Looks like our first pass of Memtest 86 is complete. Uh, let me take a quick look here. Okay, so. As you can see now, it's running on test number four. It's on pass number two, and we have zero errors. So as a result of that, I feel pretty confident that we don't have any RAM issues, but we still could. <laughs> I want to emphasize, if it did find bad RAM, then we definitely have bad RAM. But if it didn't find bad RAM, then we probably don't have bad RAM, but we can't trust that 100%. But it's a good start, and it's what we want to see. So with that, I can just go ahead and shut the machine off. I'm just going to hold the power button in until it shuts off. And I have some notes from the customer with regards to how we can replicate the problem. Uh, I am concerned as to whether or not there is an M.2 drive installed. So what I want to do is I'm going to cut the power and I want to take the heat sinks off and visually inspect if we have an M2 drive in there. Okay, so it's empty. And I'm just going to leave this out because I, I have a short memory span. <laughs> I want to make sure it stays out so I don't think, oh, did I check that? So. We know we're running with uh, just the solid state two and a half inch drive and the mechanical two and a half inch drive. And I'm really curious what that mechanical two and a half inch drive is. So let's take a quick look at what we're working with here. It is unfortunate that he has probably one of the slowest laptop drives on the market because it says Toshiba on it. And that has been my experience that these drives are known for being painfully slow. Now I want you to take a look at the date. Can you guys notice the date right there? This drive is eight years old. This drive all by itself, and he's, he's just got one screw holding it in there. This drive all by itself will bring this computer to its knees. Mixing old hardware and new hardware is a recipe for disaster. I understand the logic. The logic is, uh, I got this drive laying around, I'd like to use it. Well, what I would do is use it through USB. I would not install it internally. What I want to do is hook up my own drive to this and install a nice clean Windows 10 on it. This is the crucial drive that had a it had a screw stuck in it on the edges and I was trying to drill it out and I cracked it. You can see there's a crack right across here. And it was because these two screws on this side for that reason, I would never install this in a customer's build. 
So a drive like this is good to have around the shop to use for situations like this for testing. And this way we're not messing around with uh, the customer's data or um, you know, risking uh, damaging the operating system or anything like that. I'm assuming everything's on this drive here. So all we have to do is take the existing SATA cable that was hooked up to that old mechanical drive and we'll place that on here like so. And then I need a Windows 10 installation media, which I have right here. And we'll plug that into one of these blue USB ports back here. And we'll just spin that around. And let's see, we'll plug in some power. And then let's install a nice clean copy of Windows 10. So let me move you back over to camera two. And we should see the Windows 10 installation media boot up automatically. I always disconnect the customer's hard drive because I want to make sure that I don't make a mistake and erase the wrong drive or configure the wrong drive. Whenever you're building or working on a computer, you want to make sure you only have one hard drive attached to the system so that it avoids any mistakes or confusion. Okay, we're just about done with that. And I guess this thing doesn't have Wi-Fi on it, does it? I guess I'm going to grab some Windows updates with this. So I'm going to grab uh, an Ethernet cord so we can grab Windows updates. And then once it senses, yeah, I can click no there and click OK here. It wants to force me to create a Microsoft account, but down in this lower corner, I can say skip for now. And now we can go to Windows Update and we can grab uh, not only the updates to Windows 10, but also uh, driver updates as well for um, the graphics card and other installed hardware. Uh, my screen has gone black for some reason. I don't know what's going on, but we'll be patient and see what happens here in a minute. Uh, in the meantime, just so you guys don't freak out, I'll put camera one back on so you can see that... Um, there I am. I think the machine's rebooting or something. I don't know what it's doing. Yeah, it's restarted itself. So <clears throat> we'll keep an eye on it here. I, I, that's not normal. Usually after Windows Update, it'll be a restart button you've got to press. It doesn't normally just do that on its own. So I'm not exactly sure what happened right there, but that's pretty interesting. These retries will often happen when an update is already happening in the background. And so it's trying to install the same update twice and whichever one gets there first essentially causes the other one to fail. So one of the ways we get around this, in this case it's happened about three times, one way is you can be patient, which, you know, I'm not. The other way is you can sort of force it by restarting the computer and that will force it to finish those updates. And then when it comes back up again, we can start uh, whatever updates are remaining. We'll check and, and, and grab those. We're going to go back to Windows Update. So we keep getting an update error on this. This is pretty unusual. On this cumulative update, um, that's very, very unusual. And it may be a key to finding out what the problem is. There's a good chance that what's ever causing that update to error out is also responsible for the blue screens. And that, you know, we've already checked with RAM with regards to uh, BEMTEST86, but remember that doesn't guarantee 
that the RAM is 100%. Yeah, we're back to that same error again. This is very unusual, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do is um, I think I'm going to update this graphics card driver first and foremost because I want to test the graphics card to see if during the benchmarking it causes any uh, blue screen errors. And so for that, I need to know what graphics card I've got, which I'm not even sure. Let me look at, um, uh, let's just go in the control panel. And we'll go under, let's see, large icon view, system, device manager should tell us what graphics card we've got here. Display adapter. So GTX 1660. So I'm going to go to NVIDIA.com. Oh. Oh. This is new. So the whole computer has uh, rebooted itself. Very interesting. Very interesting. So here's what we do know. We know that this is a clean install of Windows 10, so we know we don't have a software-related issue here. And we know that just uh, we, we have a Windows update that's failing, and just by browsing the web trying to update the graphics driver, the system has reset itself. So I'm going to try this again. And what we really want to see is consistency. We want to be able to see the same error happen often. We're going to go to NVIDIA, and I'm going to, once again, attempt to download the driver for the graphics card, which I mentioned was, what, a GTX 1660. Yeah, that looks good enough. We'll just do that. So as you can see, the driver installed without a problem. So no issues there. What I want to do is grab my um, utilities flash drive right here and we'll plug that in uncle carries windows 10 optimizer let's throw that on there real quick just because we can and that's available uh, it sells for like 10 bucks over at uh, the links are in the video notes it's just a little app i made that that just does little minor tweaks that you can do by hand this just does it all for you consistently when you work on a lot of machines like I do to automate that process is a huge time saver. And it looks like the machine has automatically reset itself in the midst of my utility running. That's not supposed to happen. So, uh, at this point right now, I suspect we could have uh, incompatible RAM is potential. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shut the machine down and I'm going to just randomly pull one RAM module. I think I'll take this one here on the edge because it's easier for me to get to. Looks like only one side comes off. So the RAM we're using, if we want to look at the details of this RAM, is um, G-Skill Ripjaws 5, which can run up to 3600, which really shouldn't be a problem. So I'm going to leave one RAM module out. We're going to start the computer up again. And let me bring you back to camera two. And let's take a look here. We could have a RAM incompatibility here. I'm going to try and run my utility again. Let's see if we have any better luck this time around. Wants to restart. Yes. And let's try the next thing. You know, it's pretty interesting to me <clears throat> the way the machine is randomly restarting. And that's a good thing. Nothing worse than a customer sends you a computer where you cannot replicate the problem. Um, this we're obviously able to replicate. It does seem to be happening randomly. And at this point, everything is suspect, including the power supply, could cause these kind of symptoms. And that's sort of 
you know, one of the frustrating parts of this job can be um, that every potential component can, when failing, can all share the same symptoms. So I think what I'll do is I'll take over um, Prime 95. Let's bring that over. Uh, crystal disk mark I want. And crystal disk info I want, because that'll give us information on that mechanical drive later, which I'm not too worried about right now. Am I forgetting? Oh, I want HW info. Let's put the heaven benchmark on here. See if it'll run through that without rebooting itself. That'd be uh, interesting. So far, the machine's been running good since I pulled that one RAM module out, but let's not jump to any conclusions. And then F9, I think, starts the benchmark. There it goes. And let's see if it completes this without any uh, issues. Now, you can see it, it ran that test just fine with no problems. So let's, let's check the other memory module out. Let me, um, let me close this down. The one in my left hand has these timings. Manufacturing dates 2018 of September, DDR4 3600. And then this one can go up in front of it. 19, 20, 20, 40, down, yeah, 1.35, Intel XMP ready. What is on that memory module? There's something on it right there. Don't know what that is. Should I be concerned? It's kind of gross. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but it's kind of gooey. There's something GUI on this memory module. Now this is a heat spreader, so in theory it shouldn't matter, but it's just sort of a something to be aware of. What I'm gonna do is put both memory modules back in and I want to run the heaven benchmark one more time. But let's fire it back up and um, we'll run the Heaven Benchmark again, or at least attempt to run it and see what happens. So once again, I will bring you back over to camera two. Maybe. Maybe not. Interesting. Shut it off. I'm going to pull one memory module out. Okay, we'll fire it up again. It sounds like it's initializing. Yeah, that's good. And there's our post screen. We'll wait for it to go into Windows. I'm gonna try and put that memory module back in one more time. Try and get some consistency here. Remember, and I want to underscore, that I'm using a test hard drive, just a spare hard drive, in this case a solid state drive, for doing all this testing so that none of the customer's data is being altered in any way, shape, or form. We've not even so much as seen the customer's desktop. It's not necessary until we get this figured out. So that boots up just fine. Let me shut it back down. Then when I'm putting the memory in, I definitely want to make sure the switch is off. And one more time, we'll see if we can't seat this a little bit better than it was seated before. Oh, I heard it click that time. Okay, let's try again.
Now, just for giggles, let's go into the BIOS. And we can turn XMP on just to see what will happen. Uh, let's see. See, it's showing at 2133, and I thought it wanted 2400. Load XMP setting is on auto. Well, that's interesting. Let's set it there. And then usually what F10 is usually save and exit. Save configuration, exit, yes. This should get interesting. Let's see if it'll even post. So far, so good. And we'll run uh, Heaven again. Okay, well, the test ran and it was successful. Let's do this. I still have a few minutes left, so let's start Prime 95 and see where it takes us and monitor these temps and see what happens. So I think our temps are looking just fine. I really don't see any issues here temperature-wise. I'm going to go ahead and, and close this down and start wrapping it up for today. And I will continue the testing. Uh, I'll do the time spy test. Um, we'll pick it up uh, tomorrow. What we discovered here is the RAM that this person selected to use with their AMD system is uh, DDR4 3600 speed RAM. Now, a lot of people say, well, that RAM is too fast, but you have to understand that if you told me you had an 800 horsepower car, I can't determine how fast you drive it. You understand? An 800 horsepower car still does the speed limit. As such, the speed limit should be set by the chipset. So if the speed limit of the chipset is 3000 and this RAM can do 3400, so what it said, 3,600, then, and just like the speed limit, your car with 800 horsepower should have no problem getting to 65 miles an hour, no differently than any other car. It can go faster than that. Well, that's what the speed on the RAM means. It means it has the potential to go up to 3,600. It doesn't mean it runs at 3,600. It means it runs up to 3,600. The bottom line is that the, there's a chip on this board, this little circuit board that's behind this metal heat shield, that when you plug it in, it says, here's what I am and here's what I can do. And the BIOS is supposed to read that and adjust to what this says it can do. It says, I am this speed and I am this fast and I am, you know, my CAS latency is this. And the BIOS reads that information from the SPD chip on this and it adjusts. That's why it's one of the things that takes a while on your first boot. Remember I told you it's, the motherboard's acquainting itself with the CPU you've installed. It's acquainting itself with the RAM you put in. Well, there's information being fed off of the chips that the BIOS reads and adjusts and accommodates, and that's supposed to happen automatically if everybody followed the standards. But somebody here isn't following the standard. So someone says, well, what, what motherboard would this RAM be compatible with? Well, in theory, it should be compatible with every motherboard that accepts DDR4 RAM. It's probably a BIOS issue or something on the uh, serial presence device is not meeting standard requirement. I don't know, and I don't care. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just offer Shelby a trade. This is 16 gigs. I've got 16 gigs of slower memory. I'll just trade it out and I'll use this. Uh, and literally, probably any other motherboard, it'll probably be fine. So I talked to Shelby, I said, here's what, I, here's what I'm recommending. Uh, what I'm recommending are um, trade me the RAM. I won't charge anything. Just trade me out because I'm trying to help them out. 
let's get rid of the laptop drive, let's destroy it. That should be completely destroyed. It, should, it has no reason to be used anymore. It's too old to be reliable. It's too old to be useful. It's too slow. So um, it, it doesn't have much life left in it. I can tell you that drive isn't going to last much longer. And, and to use it, you know, life is too short to, life is too short to use an old 5400 RPM hard drive. And then let's pull the solid state drive because I think what they did here is they bought a Samsung, uh, whatever this is. So that what they've got here, oh, it's not bad. It's a 500 gig Samsung 860 Evo, but still the 860s, I believe, are pretty old. What I'd like to do, my recommendation, is to encourage uh, Shelby and Dwayne to let me donate this to one of the veteran giveaway computers. It's an older slow drive, right? The 860 series, I'm looking if there's a manufacturing date on here. And what I want to do is replace it because combined, if you got 500 gigs here and this is a one terabyte drive, right? I believe that's one terabyte. What I'd like to do, destroy the mechanical drive, give away, you know, wipe and reload Windows 10 and pu put it in one of the veteran giveaways and then put in, a Sam um, this is an Intel 660p NVMe solid state drive that's Again, two terabytes, so it's going to be more storage, less cabling, less to break, much, much faster than, first of all, what were the reads on this? 80? The reads on this? 2,000. The reads on this are going to be about 550 at the maximum. The reads on this, 2,000. So this is uh, one quarter the size of capacity and about one quarter the speed. Mm between a third and a quarter speed. And then of course, this is four times larger, three to four times faster, and there's no cabling required. And then we'll reinstall Windows 10 fresh and clean. They want Windows 10 Pro. They had home, I don't know why they want Pro, but if they want Pro, we'll put Pro on there for them. And then once again, we'll run the benchmark on it. And then it'll be ready to be shipped back. Once the uh, Windows 10 is installed clean, we get all the Windows updates, NVIDIA driver, will be the latest one, the AMD chipset driver, of course. And then we'll run Time Spy on it, and it should fly. And we'll put this drive cage back in. It'll be empty, it'll stay empty. And everything else looks good. So that's the plan today. This is our Intel 660p, two terabyte drive. And I can tell you, when Shelby and Dwayne get this computer back, they're gonna be blown away by how fast it is. This is a, a big improvement because they did everything else so well. They, I think they did pick very good parts. I think they dropped the ball when it came to their storage. I really think that they would have avoided this entire scenario by perhaps spending a little less money on the RAM. Now, I don't know how much money they spent on that RAM, but I can tell you that the, the slower RAM would have been cheaper and they wouldn't have had this problem. And they could have taken the money they saved put it towards like an Intel 660p and gotten th three to four times the performance. So it's really not so much how much you spent, but what you spent it on. I'd rather see actual improvements in performance with solid state going to NVMe than perceived performance differences in certain applications with faster memory and XMP turned on. So what I'm gonna do, and this is a, a tight fit in here, the M.2 slot is above the graphics card. So I guess I'm going to start by taking the graphics card out. So at least, because I, I have to get up underneath this heat sink. You'll notice when I work on the system, I work on it uh, while it's completely unplugged. So what I'm going to do is the M.2 drive, there's a small screw that has to come out. And for that, I use the, the JIS screwdriver that you guys let me know about, and this JIS driver, and by the way, all these tools you see me use, from this rotating table to the cordless driver to the knife, all this stuff is in my Amazon store because people are always asking me, where did you get that? So I put it all in the Amazon store. Anytime you make a purchase from Amazon, if you use my link that takes you to Amazon, 
any purchase you make from the visit that that you know that my link took you to Amazon, uh, a small commission goes to the channel. It actually gets split between Mike Smith and myself for tech vets. So the price that you pay isn't any different. So if you shop at Amazon regularly or anyway, if you use my link that's in the video notes to take you to Amazon, even if you don't buy any of the stuff that's in the link, but you buy something else from the same browser visit, a small commission comes back to the channel. At no, no change of anything for you, the purchaser. Just so you know, it's a great way to show support for stuff you were going to buy anyway. And it looks like... It looks like I don't have the screw for the M.2 drive. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's not it. Let me take a look. This might stop me in my tracks before I even got started here. Let's see how far this goes. It does go right to that point. That's where I need it. It's missing a screw, which I think probably was in the box with the motherboard and they didn't send it to me because I didn't think about it. So that's my fault. So what I'm curious about is how necessary that screw actually is. Because when we put the heat shield on it, it's pretty well going to lock it in place. I think it's going to work just fine without it. So for now, I'm going to test that theory. If we did not have this heat shield, we'd absolutely have to have the, the screw to secure it down. And in a perfect world, I would have spare M.2 screws. Uh, these are really, really tiny ones, though, very tiny and shallow because it's also an ASRock board, which I don't, I don't use many of those. I'm sure I could go on Amazon and order one. I'll reach out to the customer and see if they've got the little bag of screw. They could probably mail it to me, first class mail, and I could install it. I'm just trying to figure out which direction this goes on. It's very difficult to work on the system with it upright and rotating like this. So what I need to do just for a moment, and I know it's, you're probably not getting much of a view anyway, I, I want to lay this flat. I just want to be careful with the graphics card. Let's get that out of the way. Heat spreader better. Heat spreader better. And that heat spreader is going to hold that M.2 drive down. But ideally, we'd have a screw in there to secure it just to be safe. But for right now, just temporarily, I think I can get away with it. My concern would be if I shipped it that way that the drive could forcibly come out from the socket and be underneath the heat. It won't go anywhere, but it just won't be plugged in anymore. Ideally, the, the thermal tape is sticky enough that it's making contact with that drive so it won't move around. But those screws are so tiny. They're very easy to misplace, and they're not something you generally can go to the hardware store locally and buy at Home Depot. or You, know. you, you pretty much have to get the screw specifically for the manufacturer. The screws ASRock uses are different from the screws Gigabyte uses. So I think ASRock and ASUS use the same ones, but I'm not positive. Um, this is a disadvantage I have when I'm working on other people's builds is I don't have the box of parts. And I didn't know when they shipped it to me that it wasn't, you know, already have an M.2 drive. I didn't know that the screws weren't already going to be in the motherboard. Because the manufacturers all do it differently. But with that out of the way, let me put the graphics card back in it. That's better. They've got these silver screws on the power supply. I'd like to change those out for black screws just to keep it all pretty. 
And I've got some spare ones back here I can use. Oh, that's going to look a lot better. Much better. Now, there's still three screws here. What did those go to? Imagine, oh, four screws went to the bottom of this. Okay, that's probably what was holding it in. Um, and then I'll wire tie this, or nylon zip tie this CPU fan, so it'll clean that up. But yeah, we should be able to power this on and get Windows 10 installed right now. Okay, now let's turn this on. And we'll go to that input, which is camera two there. And now we should get to the BIOS, or uh, not the BIOS, but the, uh, it should automatically boot to the Windows 10 installation media because the NVMe drive we just plugged in has never been formatted. It has no partition or format on it. So the only thing this computer can boot to, if it checks every connected thing, is the flash drive. And there it is, just as predicted. And if I grab the proper mouse, there it is, we should be able to step right through this process. And it should see the Intel drive without me changing anything in the BIOS. It should just offer it as the only installation option. I always tell it I do not have a product key. Always tell it that during the install. But make sure you install the proper Windows 10 for the product key you do have. With, when you enter the product key, it automatically knows which Windows 10 you have. But I'm going to install Windows 10 Pro. The key I put in it will be for Windows 10 Pro. And I will do that later during the process instead of now. You have to accept the end user license agreement. And we always choose custom install. And there's our two terabyte Intel drive. All I have to do is hit next. And now we just wait. The drive is now being partitioned and formatted as Windows 10 begins to install. Well, let, let me go back now to Windows Update. We're going to check one more time. And at this point, it should come back and say, we've got all of our updates now. Then I can download the NVIDIA driver. And I also want to put on the AMD chipset driver. I also want to run Uncle Kerry's uh, Windows 10 optimizer on it. And then we can put Time Spy back on it and run the Time Spy demo because it was crashing. It wouldn't complete that demo before, and that was the whole reason. It was trying to play games in Steam, and the games just wouldn't play. And um, they found that by running the Time Spy demo, that was a way I could emulate it without having to log into Steam. Although most people get the Time Spy demo from Steam, you can find, if you Google it, you can find a site where you can download it. It's a big six gig download. So what do I want to do first? Uh, let's run, hmm, let's grab the AMD chipset driver first. So the way I'm going to do that, we'll bring up the browser, we'll just type in uh, AMD chipset driver, or thereabouts, I might have typoed somewhere. And we'll click on that first link, and we want chipsets right here, chipsets. Socket AM4, and we've got a socket 470, and hit Submit. There's our Windows 10 drivers right there. Get the cookie notification out of our way. AMD chipset drivers, we're going to save that. And we'll open it, and we will run that file. We'll just hit Run. And while that's doing that, we can close. We're going to click yes. I can close all these windows that are open behind it because they're just clutter and distracting. This is what we want to see happening, which is the chipset drivers installing, or the, the installation files are extracting into a temporary folder. And then it's going to come up with our installation options here with green checkboxes already selected for the drivers. Hit install right down there. And now we just wait a few moments for that to install, and then it'll need to reboot for those drivers to take effect. And that's going to improve our drive performance. We can also download the Intel NVMe driver and the Intel SSD toolbox as well to maintain the performance and monitor the Intel SSD and schedule basically a trim command uh, once a week or however often we want to run it. Now, Windows 10 automatically does that on its own, but the Windows SSD toolbox offers you much more granular control. Let's hit restart and we'll let those chipset drivers take effect. And then let's see what happens with, uh, let's see. 
Uh, what do I want to do? The NVIDIA driver. We'll do the NVIDIA driver next. That's a 1660. Okay, so there's the NVIDIA driver. Now let me get the Windows 10 optimizer installed on there. Let's close that. And close that. Let's install TimeSpy. So we'll go here to PC testing software. This is a big application. It's like, uh, what is it? 6.3 gigs. So what I'm going to do, just to make it install a little quicker, we'll just copy the whole installation folder to the desktop. And we'll go back and look for, let's go to Google. And let's, let's go to um, Intel SSD, no, NVMe client. Download center for Intel right here. Download client NVMe driver. That's for a floppy. I don't want that. Set up NVMe.exe. That's the one I want. Again, this is only for Intel NVMe drives. And it's optional. You don't have to have it. Accept the license terms. We'll save it. Probably didn't have to save it, but now we'll hit run. And down here, click yes. Hit next. Accept the end user license agreement. Hit next, next. And it will reboot for that driver to take effect since that's the main driver communicating with the solid state drive. It has to reboot just like you have to stop your car to change a tire. Uh, the system has to restart for the driver for the storage system to take effect. I'm going to go back to Google. And we'll do the Intel SSD toolbox. Download the Intel solid state toolbox. Now that's for all solid state drives, not just NVMe drives. We want the latest, which is 3.5.12 as of March 30th. We'll grab the executable file and just run it. We don't have to save it. It's an 82 meg file. It's not too big. And then we can close that window and we'll let the SSD toolbox install here real quick. All right, we should be able to run TimeSpy now. Oh, there's updates to it. We'll get the updates, of course. I always forget about that. All right, we're going to run the TimeSpy benchmark. So there's our 3D Mark score. It finished TimeSpy successfully with a score of 5592, which is pretty much what we would expect from this system. And there's our specs. Again, it's an AMD Ryzen, uh, what is that, 2600K? Is that what it says? and our 1660 graphics card with the latest drivers. I still have uh, uh, Shelby and Dwayne's, Dwayne's computer behind me that I want to finish up and get shipped back out to them. They mailed me the M.2 screws uh, that I needed. You can't just put these in a paper envelope and mail them. The envelope will tear and I'll get an empty envelope. It's happened. So they just have to go into like a bubble wrap envelope, a bubble envelope or a padded envelope, which is what they did. We're going to change out this cooler for a Mugen 5, and the RAM I put in there was 32 gigs of RAM since I'm doing an even Steven swap. I need to replace it with what they had, which was 16. And so for that, I've got some uh, XPG Gaming D10 RAM, brand new in a box. That's uh, 16 gigs total. We'll make sure that that's going to work okay. First thing I need to do is tighten down the M.2 drive. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the graphics card out of here so I have some room to work. I think I'm going to go ahead and pull the uh, cooler off while I'm doing this, and then that'll give me even more room to access the M.2 without the heat sink in, in the way. So we'll start, I think I'm going to start by pulling the heat sink off because that's super easy to do. Putting it on is difficult, but taking it off is pretty easy on these uh, Cooler Master 212s. There it goes. All right, so there's the fan. I guess I can pull the RAM while I'm in there too. 
This should be a pretty straightforward, uh, fairly simple upgrade at this point, since there's no diagnostics to do. One last screw down here on the corner. There it is. So the uh, amount of thermal material on here is a bit scant. So we're going to clean that up and make that a bit better. Well, at least what I, in my opinion, think is better. And that includes having to remove this back plate since it's going to all go together with the cooler. Part of what makes this cooler difficult to install are these nuts that go on the back plate here. I think we have a winner, 3 eighths. So we'll just put that right on the end. This ratchets. And we'll just loosen those all up. I've seen people use uh, needle nose pliers or regular pliers. It's a great way to scratch up the back of your board and potentially uh, round out the nuts and could cause damage if you're careless with it. So this is really uh, using a nut driver is the safest and easiest way. And once you buy the tool, as long as you don't misplace it, you'll, you can use it the rest of your life. It's unlikely you'll ever break one. You're more likely to lose them. Take these off. You'll see they're just spinning right out. And what I'll do is I'll get a Ziploc bag and we'll keep all these parts together. So if we ever want to reuse this cooler, I don't know why I'd want to, but I can't see throwing it away because it's perfectly fine for the right application. So I think the back plate's going to have to come out next. And the way the screws are in this back plate, it's like glued down in there, not literally. You kind of have to wiggle everything a bit to get these uh, little standoffs out. So we'll pull out those. And as we pull those out, the back plate should fall off. And so to pull these out, I just have to kind of grab them and sort of turn them and pull left and right and wiggle until it just kind of falls out. So now we've got the back plate off and all the screws. And I'll just get a little Ziploc bag to put all that stuff in. <clears throat> so behind this heat spreader is the M.2 drive. So we'll go ahead and remove these screws, which again are very small screws, but they're only used on the heat spreader. They're not used anywhere else on the motherboard. So it's really important that you don't lose them. And because they're so tiny, uh, using a magnetic screwdriver for all of your PC building needs is always highly encouraged. Now there's a sticky thermal tape on the underside of this heat sink, and if I pull it straight off, it's going to try and pull that M.2 drive off. To avoid resistance, what I'm going to do is pull it slightly away and to the left so that the M.2 drive can unplug and stay connected to the heat sink where I can more cautiously and carefully remove it from the sticky uh, thermal tape underneath. So we're going to push it this way and out. Oh, actually, we got lucky. The tape wasn't sticking that hard to the M.2. So there's the M.2 right there. And I asked Shelby to send me both screws for both M.2 uh, sockets because I intend to leave the screws in the motherboard so they'll never encounter the situation of having to locate the screws when they need them. I feel like motherboard manufacturers, by default, should be leaving these screws installed. Some do, some don't. Obviously, uh, ASRock has decided, as has ASUS, to not keep them on the motherboard versus Gigabyte. Uh, who does uh, leave them on the board where they should be. So I'm going to put this other screw where there's the other M.2 slot over here. There's a little standoff, and I'm just going to put it right into the standoff. Again, the way I think the motherboard should have shipped. Don't over-tighten it. We just bring it down till it gets to a gentle stop. It's not going to back off on its own. Now we can put the heat shield back on. We've secured the M.2 drive, and so the two screws that secure the heat shield once we line this back up, working with the case laying flat is much, much easier. But if you're making videos, it's not very helpful to the people watching. I'm going to prep the Mugen 5 right now. So the Mugen 5 cooler is available on Amazon. It's $47.99 in America. 
they're widely available. I think there's a delay in shipping for a couple of weeks. If you're patient, it's worth waiting for. If you anticipate you're going to want to do this upgrade to your current system to upgrade to the Mugen 5, even from a liquid cooler, it's often an upgrade, depending on the liquid cooler. You should uh, plan in advance, you know, if it's something you're going to want to do next month, order it now. So in this bag right here, these are all of our parts we need for installing this cooler on AMD and Intel systems. Now because this is a AMD system, we're going to use the brackets. They look like parentheses. These are the AMD brackets. These straight up and down brackets, these are used for Intel. So we won't be using the Intel stuff. The, these little brackets, these hold the fan on and they give us an extra set if we want to add another fan on the other side of the cooler. It's unnecessary. We're not going to do that. So two of those will be put away. Two of these we need. Um, we definitely need the... Wait a minute. Let me think for a minute. We don't use this back plate. This back plate is for, for Intel only. And you can tell the way the holes are set on the Ryzen board, they're rectangular, whereas this is square. So we won't use the back plate. Instead, oh, I just realized. There is a stock back plate that comes with the motherboard that we have to have. Growl. So that throws a little wrench in today's works. I, uh, I, I don't like to be reactive, and I'm being reactive right now. I should have already thought of that. Darn it. And I think I'm stuck now. Rats. I'll have to reach out to the owner of the computer and see if they still have that back plate. I should have thought of that when he did the M.2 screws. The fact of the matter is I didn't even think about upgrading the cooler until after that whole M.2 thing was dealt with. And I think they had already mailed the package. They were quick about it. So I'll reach out to them again about the back plate. And hopefully they still have it. If not, it's pretty standard regardless of who makes the motherboard. It's any back plate from any motherboard manufacturer should work fine. I don't work on many AMD systems. And when I do, uh, I have plenty of those little plastic tops that would connect to the back plate because I installed Mugen 5 coolers but I don't have any spare back plates. I'd have to rob one off a brand new motherboard, which I could do if I was desperate. Rats, rats, rats. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I can at least get the RAM installed. So here I've got the uh, XPG Gaming, or I'm sorry, Gamix D10 RAM from ADATA. DDR4, uh, 3000 megahertz RAM, it's the eight, eight gigs per stick for a total of 16 gigs. And the tape has never even been cut on this. It's brand new. I've had it sitting in my back office for a while for just this occasion or a, for a customer need. I actually bought it thinking I would chalk up the loss. And then this unexpected event happened, and now I'm glad I've got it. Who knew? Uh, let's see. We're going to go in this slot here. And, and again, this is what the RAM looks like. This is the XPG stuff. Okay. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the graphics card back in so I don't lose anything. we got to keep everything together. And we'll put the screws back in that secure that. I'm going to grab a Ziploc bag. I'm going to need it anyway for the spare parts. And I'm just going to put all the moving five parts in it for right now. And then we'll revisit this in a couple of days, maybe next week when I have some time. We'll finish the uh, cooler install. So 
So the good news is the, the back plates are widely available online. I ordered one from Newegg and one from Amazon to see which one would get here first. The one I ordered from Newegg, uh, they both run under $10. Uh, the one from Newegg arrived in three days, and the one from Amazon, it's been over a week. It's still not here. I think I'm going to see it next week sometime. But I thought it would be a good idea to have a spare. So I thought, you know, whichever one comes first, then I can continue my video. To my surprise, it arrived earlier than expected. Here's what it looks like. I think this was $6.99 at Newegg. And of course, we don't need the yellow parts here. We just need that big back plate right there. And it's standard. It fits all AMD, AM4 motherboards. Your board would have come with that from the factory. But if you had, like in this case, replaced, uh, if you had installed a third-party cooler that uses its own custom back plate, it's important that you keep all of your old parts. You'll always see me do that. You'll always, when I do a brand new build, you'll, I always emphasize that the customer gets all the parts I'm not using, anything extra SATA cables, extra screws, even the front bay covers. If we're putting a DVD drive in, they get the cover because the unexpected happens. And then when you need that specific part, especially if it's like a front bay cover for a case, it may be very difficult to find. Uh, furthermore, it's a shame to have to buy something you already had. So I recommend you always keep all of your spare parts because you just don't know what you're going to need in the future. I'm of the belief that it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And since you've already got it anyway, <clears throat> why throw it away? What's the point of that? Um, it, in the case of parts, uh, spare parts left over from a computer build, they're all small parts. I do the same thing when I install the Mugen 5 cooler. It comes with a lot of different mounting uh, uh, standoffs and parts for different configurations. Well, who's to say that the customer is going to keep this configuration forever? I mean, sooner or later, it's going to change. Maybe they want to continue to use that Mugen 5. Well, maybe they won't be able to if they don't have those parts, and it'd be darn near impossible to just find standoffs for it. And for what it would cost, you might as well just buy a whole new cooler. So <clears throat> this is a prime example of exactly why you always save spare parts. So this has delayed this repair. I don't know. We're going on a few weeks now. What I wanted to do is install the Mugen 5 cooler. I've kind of put everything together here with the system, all the parts that belong to it. That's how I stay organized. <clears throat> You'll see the tape is still on the bottom. We're not removing that until we're ready to install the cooler. Of course, we've got the, the fan. And uh, these are all the spare cooler parts. We're going to need the, the uh, thermal compound, which is in here. Look how organized I am. These are some spare screws left over from the work I'm doing. I'm going to send those back for all the reasons I've already explained. The customer is going to retrieve, receive those. This is the old mechanical drive. We're trashing that. And then this is the old solid state drive. That'll go into a future uh, veteran giveaway. And then the customer will receive their two SATA cables back because they might want to add a larger drive in the future maybe a large mechanical drive or whatever. And uh, they belong to the customer, and the customer should receive them. So with this AM4 bracket that I ordered from Newegg for, I think, $7, we're going to take the, uh, I don't even know what you call it, this, this bracketing part with the screws. That just comes off. And we won't use the screws or these yellow parts. We just need the, the back plate itself. Everything else will be provided by Mugen with the cooler. They just didn't provide this part. They assumed, as they rightly should, that you would already have this. The benefit of using a backplate you already have reduces the overall cost of the cooler. Also makes the installation a lot easier, since you're not having to replace anything, uh, or you're, you're replacing fewer things with regards uh, to not having to replace the, the backplate. So stuff like this, again, I would give the customer these parts just so they have them if they ever wanted to go back to a traditional AMD cooler for some reason. <clears throat> and the back plate is simply going to go on into the back, just like this. There's no right side up. It doesn't matter which way you put it on. No side of it says top or anything like that. And then in the, uh, in the bag, that uh, this has all our spare parts, uh, that all the parts, rather, that came with the cooler, 
we're going to pull out the parts we need for AMD. So we're going to need um, we're going to need these two brackets that they kind of look like parentheses. They're they're bent like that. These are for use on AMD systems. These straight ones, these are used for Intel systems, so we won't use those at all. We need two of these brackets to hold the fan, and they include two extras if you want to add another fan on the other side, which we're not going to do. The back plate here is for Intel only, so that can go in the bag. And it's been a while since I've done AMD. We can take a quick look at the instructions on the Mogan 5. And you can see how many different socket types the Mogan 5 is compatible with. For example, it's compatible with the Intel LGA 2011 and 2066, as well as the LGA 775, 1150, 1151, 1155, 1156, and 1366. And on the AMD side, you got AM2, AM2+, AM3, AM3+, AM4, FM1, FM2, and FM2+. A lot of different socket types are covered here. Basically, every modern socket you can buy today except Threadripper is supported. And if I look here on the uh, AMD instructions, they've got us taking the... Uh, the little bracket off of here. This one shows it as one piece. Obviously on this one it's two pieces. And they've got us putting a little standoff on the top and then putting the long screws in there. So what that's referring to is we're not using any of these standoffs. These are all used on, on Intel boards. What we are going to use is in this bag, you'll see there are some black, well they're calling them standoffs, but they're black spacers and then these long screws. And those are gonna hold that back plate in that fell out here. So let me just take that out real quick. And then what else is in this bag are uh, rubberized uh, pads that go on an additional fan to help reduce any uh, noise caused by vibration. So the fan, the rubber pads stick to the fan and then the rubber pads go against the side of the heat sink so you don't have plastic against the metal to vibrate and make noise. That's what that's for because we're not adding any extra fan, we'll just keep that little, there's four little, they're all die cut, but there's four of them, one for each corner of the fan. And so what I have to do, and this'll, this'll be a little tricky because it requires more hands than I have really, is I gotta hold this in place, we'll line it up, hold it in place, and then put this washer on and secure that. And I can just start turning it by hand. And I want to just do the opposite corner and that should hold that back plate in for the other two screws without me having to uh, need three arms, three hands. And with those two started, I've got the uh, electric driver here on a torque setting of three. No, I'm screwing this up. There's a, <laughs> I gotta put the bracket on. So I can't just put that in like that. I, I wasn't thinking. I've gotta put these brackets on between the top of that uh, spacer and the screw. It's gonna hold this bracket in place. So. But that's okay. I'll use the, the one screw I've got in there to help hold it in position. <clears throat> and unlike the Intel, you cannot put the bracket on. So with Intels, you could put the bracket on this way or this way, but it's only going to work if you put the bracket on the right orientation. On AMD, it's only going to fit uh, in one direction because it's rectangular instead of square. And you want the outside of the bracket uh, away from the socket on both sides. So it'll just kind of look like it's surrounded by a giant metal parentheses. Best way I could explain that. And then there's two holes, and I'm not quite sure if we're using the the inner side of the hole or the outer side. We're going to find out here in a minute though. It's been a little little while since I've done this, and I just can't remember. I think we're using the inner one. 
I could be wrong. And this requires, again, you got to hold the back plate in. There's not a whole lot of screw sticking out from the other side, so it's not going to bite into that too much. If it'll focus on that, you can see it. All right, so that's what the Mugen 5 bracket looks like when it's installed correctly. So the screwdriver has a, has a uh, clutch setting on it, and you'll see these numbers around the edge. And uh, with the arrow, I've got it set on the clutch setting of three. And what that means is when this driver hits a certain resistance, it shuts off. So all the screws are tightened to the exact same amount of torque. If you're a novice, if you're just beginning, do not use an electric driver to tighten screws. You can use one to remove them. But when you tighten them, if you don't have the screw lined up exactly, you can strip out the threads. And then you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> so. so I've got this thing of Q-tips here. And this is what I've been using for years and years and years. And you can see it's uh, 190 proof. It's, it's almost all 100% alcohol. All I'm doing here is just trying to take off any, any contaminants across the edges and across the top of what this is referred to. This piece here is referred to as an internal heat spreader, or IHS. And it's just a, it's a metal cap. That's all it is. And the components underneath this get very, very hot. And this helps dissipate that heat. I don't need to dry this off. You'll see the alcohol evaporating. So as long as we just let it sit for a minute, and you can continue to do that. You can see how much of the Q-tip is dark. And you can continue if you want to until the Q-tip comes out clean. It doesn't have to be that clean. But if you want to, you can. You're not going to hurt it. Give it a moment for the alcohol to uh, completely evaporate before we apply any thermal compound. So this has had plenty of time now to evaporate the um, And I've got the tube of thermal compound that comes with the scythe cooler. They give you more than you need here. And we're just going to put a dab of that. Oh, we'll put it right about there like that. That's maybe even a little too much. We'll find out here in a minute. Then I've got my glove. So I will put my glove on. And then we're going to just finger paint the thermal compound. We want a nice thick coat, not too thick, not too thin. We certainly don't want to read the words behind it. If you can read the words rising, you don't have enough on there. If it's dripping off the sides, you have too much. So I've got plenty on my finger, and I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to use a clean finger, and I'm going to just dab it a bit and create little hills and valleys, and that helps to prevent any sort of air bubbles, not that that actually matters to anybody in reality except for extreme overclockers that use custom liquid nitrogen and fry their CPUs momentarily hitting Guinness records for moments for bragging rights and spending thousands of dollars to do it. But for normal people, that is more than adequate. For regular normal users, I should say. And you'll see that this stuff, you know, I've got it on two of the fingers there, and it's messy. When it gets on stuff, it's hard to take it off. So what I'll do is just turn the glove inside out, and it helps keep my fingers clean. If you get it on your fingers, you'll, you'll quickly find washing your hands under the sink, it stays, stays on your fingers for a couple days. OK, so with the thermal compound applied, we can now install the heat sink. Now, I'm going to lay the case flat to do this because I want to work with gravity. I do a lot of work that I should not be doing with the case upright. And that's so you guys can watch. When you guys are repeating what you see me do, I would, I would encourage you to lay the case flat when you're working like uh, anything installing cards into the motherboard, anything that in involves any downward force. Let uh, Work with gravity is what I'm saying. Don't just do it the way you see me do it. Keeping in mind, I'm doing this so you can see. On the bottom of the heat sink, there's a protective tape, and that's, again, to keep this 
surface area free of contaminants. You don't want to remove this tape until you're ready to install. Many people forget to remove the tape. Then they wonder why their CPU temperature is not as good as what you see on my videos. Now there's a side of this where the screw sticks out and there's a side where the screw comes through sort of the center. Where the screw sticks out, that's going to go towards the RAM. And we're just going to set that right over the CPU. We don't put any thermal compound on the heat sink. We only put the thermal compound on the CPU. Scythe has included this wonderful screwdriver that's going to fit straight down through that center hole at the top of the CPU so we can get to the screw underneath of it. And we'll just get that started and then come to the other screw, which is super easy to access. And we'll get that one started. And we're going to just try and tighten these evenly. We don't want to tighten one screw too much more than the other. I can't tell if I'm... Yeah, there it goes. So that one I actually tightened all the way down. I backed it off a little bit so I can tighten this one all the way down. And then I'll come back and tighten this one down. And I, I just want to prevent any sort of warping. You can't see if you've warped it. You'll only be able to know if your cooling isn't as good as it should be. Now, one of the downsides that I'm just realizing of doing this uh, is there's a fan up here at the top. Let's talk about this for a minute. Let's bring this back up. There's a cooling fan right here. I don't recommend that you have a cooling fan on the top and on the back, one or the other. As a result of this fan being up here, it's going to be very difficult. I guess we'll be okay. The screws are on the outside uh, to change this fan out. What I was about to say is if you had to come at the screws from underneath, this heat sink's in the way now. What I want to do since it's, you really want your airflow all moving in one direction, we don't want it going in two directions. We'll take this fan out and we're going to move it to the front so we can blow air over this graphics card. Again, we want all the air moving in, up, and out. That's the design. Now, if we don't have a fan here and we have one here, that's fine. And if we have one here, you want one or the other. And my suggestion is to keep the airflow straight. Don't have it change direction and coming in this way and then going up. That's weird. It's not efficient. It doesn't go with nature. So you want to work with nature. You want to go with the current of the river, right? Let it help propel you. Don't fight against it. So we're going to take this fan out. And we're going to move it up front. And we're just going to encourage airflow all moving in this direction. And you can see this fan's pretty dusty for a machine that hasn't been used much. And we want to make sure that, excuse me, <clears throat> this side of the fan is the side that's sucking air in. And this side with the brackets is the side the air is blowing out. So we want to bring the air in from the front and push it through the case. So to do that, we want to make sure we have the uh, cable management. We want the cable coming out this side like this. That one won't tighten down. So... <clears throat> I've decided to keep the NZXT logo straight up and down by having the fan come out the top. I had it rotated another uh, 90 degrees so that it was, uh, so the cable was coming out of the bottom corner, but then the logo was sideways. OCD. It doesn't affect how the fan operates, but I just want to clarify, I sort of changed my mind when I took this out and how I was initially planning to install this. There's little hooks or bent tabs up here that go into alignment holes so that this goes into the proper position. And then it'll automatically align the uh, mounting holes with these thumb screws, which don't have to be as tight as they were. Now to me, this makes more sense of a configuration. So now we've got the air coming in from the front. It'll bl blow over this area. We're going to have a fan here, obviously, and then this fan here, and all the air is moving in the same direction. It's far more efficient. Makes more sense. And then we can plug that fan right back into the same header it was in, which is right over here. Cable management on this case is fantastic, by the way. Okay, so we're going to put on the fan. Let's see, this is going to go on this way. Put that on there, that on there. I want this side to bring the air in, the side's going to blow through that metal heat sink. 
I want this cable down at the bottom, so this is going to go on like this with the cable down at the bottom. It'll plug straight into the board and cable management will look nice and clean on there. And then we'll put the other side on the same exact, same exact thing here, which is we go from the front, we use these hooks, they go into the mounting holes. The dog hair is optional, you don't have to include that. Put that on there, put that on there, and that looks like that. And then we'll put this on to the CPU fan header up here, the top of the board. So that plugs the fan on, and then the fan is going to sit in these little grooves on the Mugen 5. It's got cutouts specific for the fan. And I have to hold these little metal brackets back. Like this, seat it into the socket, push it down as far as the, push the fan in as far as it'll go. And then I just pull back on the metal bracket and it seats in between the fins on the heatsink, on the top and the bottom. And now we should be able to power this on. And we can check the thorough effectiveness rather of this cooler versus the uh, Hyper 212. That also means I can put power back onto the graphics card, which this power cable right here is, is sitting here. It needs to go, it needs to be plugged in if we're going to uh, expect any video to come out. We've got the front fan. We moved it from the top here to the front. That's all hooked up, good to go. Okay, hit the power switch. Make sure these fans are all turning. We'll put you on the uh, input of the computer. We should get a signal here in a minute. Here we go. Hopefully the new RAM I put in works. The other RAM I had was 32 gigs. This is 16 gigs, as I mentioned earlier. And I haven't tested it yet. So hopefully the RAM is happy with this motherboard. And we don't have a repeat of the same problem that we were solving. And then we can run Prime 95 and watch these temps on here. Let's run this for 15 minutes. Remember this, this here is our current temperature, which is 57.5. This is the current minimum that's been read since the software was started. And this is our current maximum temperature that we've achieved. And we're going to keep an eye on that, knowing that there's a mathematical uh, thing you've got to do with AMD. It's not a true representation of temperature. All right, we've crossed over 22 minutes. We're just near 23 minutes, which is far longer than I intended to go on the test. And the maximum temp was still 79.8. Now watch these temps. Watch how fast this current temp drops when I stop this Prime 95 test. Let me grab the right mouse. So right here, you'll see the current temperature of 79.5. And I'm going to go over here and go to the test and hit stop and confirm it. And as soon as I confirm the stop, watch that temperature right here. Watch how fast this comes down. I can also hear the fans slow down, and they're barely audible now. And they weren't that loud just a moment ago, but now I can't hear them at all. I'd say that's very successful. I'm very happy with the end result of the Mugen 5. I think it was worth the time to wait for the back plate. Um, and I will ship this exactly as I described with this facing down so this big heavy heat sink and this video card are not hanging upside down. And I'm going to put the panels back on it and I'll give you guys another spin on the Lazy Susan tomorrow. You can see what it's going to look like going back to the customer. And um, they should be ecstatic, just totally happy. So thanks you guys for, thank you for watching and I will see you all again uh, very, very soon. And until then, bye for now.